So welcome to R21.4. One of the key features of R21.4 is a new mapping technique called mesh mapping. Mesh mapping is accessed as any other mapping through the workloads and mapping properties of layers. And it enables you to create a mapping which is aware of the surfaces that it's mapping towards, even when dealing with UV mapped surfaces, screens and things within your within your space. Up till now, a lot of the content we've been pushing to curved screens or, or surfaces within virtual production has been perspective projected and then cropped off by disguise by the uh, by the geometry within our stage, which is quite inefficient. So what mesh mapping allows us to do is create a mesh mapping type and target one of our screens. And when we do that, the skies will create a perspective render from an eye point that you define that is controlled so that we only stream the pixels that are relevant to that particular mesh across render stream. So what this means is that if I start up my render now, the eye point will be known to the content engine and we will see a render from that perspective onto the surfaces that we're targeting. Now with this small screen, you could argue that you could do the same with a perspective map. Um, but with mesh mapping, what we're doing is we're actually warping before we send the pixels across the network, which is very efficient on a bandwidth perspective. We're only sending exactly the pixels that the screen needs. So you can see that uh, once render stream starts up, the mesh is rendering from the perspective that we've set and the scene origin allows me to move the origin point to, to match up with my scene that I want to create. Now, the other thing we can do with this, if I stop the cluster, is I can increase my pool size and render stream and mesh mappings interact so that the mesh will now subdivide into two perspectives. And we know that those two perspectives represent that mesh. And this is really powerful by the way, mesh mappings also work with moving or tracked screens. So if your screen moves, that's no problem whatsoever. Likewise, even if it rotates, you can have the screen uh, and the perspective all update and reorient, which is very, very powerful. So not that that's likely very often, but if you do have tracked screens in your space, this has all been uh, built to interact with all of that. So now what I'll do is I'll start up the cluster with a pool size of two. So I'll now get two renders coming out of Unreal Engine and those two renders will line up to create a single contiguous scene. So I can still move my scene origin. I can still navigate around and have all of that interaction that you'd expect, but I'm actually getting two separate uh, renders from two separate instances. So one for my left and one for my right hand side of the screen. And I can see those in these little preview widgets here. Now, the other powerful thing that we've done with mesh mapping is we've made it work with surfaces greater than 180 degrees. So if I take away my small screen and I add in my main screen and just change my MR set to target that one as well, I can now have a render which happens not just on a small surface, but on a really, really large surface. So here my mesh mapping can target my main screen and disguise will figure out that actually it needs more render instances because of the um, available bandwidth and resolutions within uh, individual fragments. It's going to have to subdivide in this case down to four instances to hit that uh, screen resolution, which is about 11 and a half thousand pixels. But I can, I can work with mesh mappings and I can apply a resolution scale. So say I wanted to do out frustum content here. I can just drop this down to say a third of full resolution, in which case this is going to fit into two render instances. And then when I start up, render stream will kick in and use my pool of two to render to those two instances that are needed to create the out frost and render for this uh, this 220 degree curve. So this is hugely advantageous, particularly on these large virtual production volumes, because 
not only are we allowing you to scale the resolution of the content that's actually rendered, but we're also setting you up to be able to render at greater than 180 degrees, which is something that's very challenging in um, in computer graphics. Most uh, most cameras can't be set up to be greater than 180 degrees, but by dividing up the the render workload like this, we can we can exceed that 180 degree limit very very easily. And you can see this works really nicely with the clustering. So I've got now my my full coverage around the around the volume. So extrapolating that, here's how I would set up a virtual production setup now using mesh mappings and spatial maps for the camera projection. So I would set up a single channel with the mesh mapping and then another channel targeting my backplate and I can use the same scene origin object in both so that they have the same reference point. And then if I start render stream, I'll now get three instances in my case because I've got a load weight of two on my mesh. So it's going to use twi twice as many uh, render nodes as the, the spatial map in the center. And now I can get three streams across the network and receive a nice looking render for both out Frustum and in Frustum. And you can just about see that here. And my camera tracking is uh, is on my in frustum and my out frustum's there with the lower resolution giving me reflections ready for use for reflections or lighting so you can see that this is a real advance to the virtual production workflows one other thing that you can do with the mesh mapping which could be useful for some people is setting the mr set itself up as a target for the um, for the mesh mapping. When you do that, you also then get an option to follow the camera. And this is interesting because what this will then enable you to do is to have the camera itself as the source for the eye point in the scene. So now that that's started up, what you can see is that my cluster is rendering for the out frustum at a low resolution and the in frustum at a high resolution based on the camera's position. But as my camera moves, the two will stay together. And what I mean by that is, for example, the tree in the center stays completely locked between the in frustum and out frustum. So everything is nicely tied together and that gives us a great opportunity to have continuous content. However, it does mean that the lighting will move as your camera moves. So that may or may not be what you want, depending on if you're doing reflections and things like that, or naturalistic content. However, all of this is available in R21.4, and I'm sure you will come up with some interesting and creative ways to use the new tools that we're making available. I hope you like it.